All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you as always for tuning in this morning. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the deputy director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from Sebastian Bay, who is a research scientist at the Center for Naval Analysis or, or CNA, as many of you might know it as, um, for his talk titled um, Designing Littoral Commander. And, and this is a talk about wargaming. I mean, we're fortunate to have a speaker who can provide insights into the field of professional wargaming, who can talk about sort of the various national security applications of wargaming from from the different venues and the different outfits that he's he's run this game for? Um, he's going to give you an inside look of you know how this is done in terms of game design um, because he himself created a very successful commercially available war game called Littoral Commander in the Pacific, which you see um, a screenshot of on the slide in front of you which is actually used by a host of professional and military educational groups to explore a hypothetical conflict between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China um, at the grand tactical level. And he's going to talk about sort of how he designed this game, how he incorporated various forms of analysis into, into the design process. So this talk should have a little bit um, in there for everybody, um, for people who are interested in designing war games themselves. Um, you can learn how difficult this is to do well. Um, uh, for those of you who are looking to participate more actively in, in the wargaming and tabletop exercise national security space, this gives you some sense of, of what participation in a game looks like, what the various forms of wargaming can look like that you might participate in, um, in, in an agency setting or, or you know, with a group of friends, you know, maybe here at the national lab. Um, but this also has things for people here at the lab who are thinking about the intersections between you know, human focused wargaming or educational wargaming and more sort of computer driven modeling and simulation exercises um, that might, might look at a China Taiwan scenario or other scenarios. So let me say a little bit about the speaker before we turn over to him for his remarks. Um, he is a senior game designer and research scientist at CNA. He works on wargaming, emerging technologies, and the future of warfare. Um, he also serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. Um, you can talk a little about maybe in his talk about his, his elective and, and how it's structured and how he teaches it. He's also a faculty advisor to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, the co-chair of the Military Operations Research Society Wargaming Community Practice, and a former fellow at the Bernie Kerlach uh, Center for Innovation and Creativity. So the ground rules for those of you unfamiliar with, with how CGSR Talks works, uh, the speaker's gonna deliver his remarks for about 30 to 45 minutes at which point we'll open the floor for discussion. You know, raise your hand electronically, submit your questions in the chat function um, as soon as you have them, as soon as as soon as you want to get in the queue. And that way we can get the discussion rolling quickly once once Sebastian's remarks conclude. And I can try to get as many of your questions and comments in in the time allotted. So Sebastian, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, I'm very excited to hear the talk. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to your game in the chat function so people can can take a look at that as you get kicked off with your mark. So thanks very much and over to you. Hey, I appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, first things first, as required, I have a disclaimer. All these opinions and views are mine alone and do not reflect uh, CNA, any of its sponsors, my employers, or any other associated institutions. Um, with that uh, aside, I will also mention that Littoral Commander Indo-Pacific and its sort of uh, forthcoming expansions are uh, my own game. They are a pet project that I did uh, on my own time uh, and dime. So although it does leverage uh, a lot of the techniques that I use for work, it is not a CNA product. It is a Sebastian Bay game. So if you dislike it, blame Sebastian, uh, blame me uh, and not CNA or any of its associated institutions. All right. So the way this lecture is sort of structured is that I'm going to give you a professional wargaming primer 101 for a very brief portion of this uh, lecture and then sort of dive into uh, some of the ways I designed the total commander from its foundational schema to some of the uh, combat engines and mechanics, and then sort of broadly uh, talk about design. And then I wanna save a lot of time over 90 minutes to do Q and A. So 
first things first, we have to do the controversial thing and yet mandatory thing of defining of what a war game is. Uh, Graham Longley Brown, who's a great war gamer in the UK, has a great comment that uh, a group of war gamers is called an argument because whenever you get a group of them together, they will argue about something, right? Whether it's the definition of what a war game is or you know, I mean, any other the many uh, hills of what is included in a war game. Uh, what is the divide between simulators and exercises and MNS and is it an ORSA technique and so forth, right? But for our discussions, a war game will be defined uh, as outlined by Peter Perla in The Art of Wargaming, which is has four major components, which is that it must have a dynamic representation of conflict or competition. There is some tension in uh, in the game. It is within an abstracted synthetic environment, right? And then there is an onus on decisions and consequences. This last portion is the most important because often this is the thing that differentiates itself from military exercises like Cobra Gold and Rim Pack and Resolute Dragon and uh, models and simulations like, or even combat engines like, um, you know what I mean? Ooh. Uh, M Tours and you know I mean Storm and so forth, right? There is a requirement for decisions and consequences, and the game construct focuses on those elements. So, think of a, a war game as having four major ingredients, which is some kind of re representation of conflict or competition. It is held within a synthetic or or abstract environment, right? That can be a map, it can be a digital platform, right? And there is an onus and center uh, focus on decisions and consequences. So in that regard, what are some of the core elements of a game, right? Um, these are sort of the five basic ingredients of what a war game is often constructed of, right? The scenario is often the context. Um, in professional settings, we often call it the road to crisis, right? Uh, this uh, is also known as the narrative or the plot line of the game, right? It is the world in which your players exist, right? This can be historical, right? It can be present day. It can be future oriented. For, for example, the road to crisis can be like, hey, how do we get to this point and what are the pressures constraints or strategic landscape in which my players are making their decisions one thing you have to understand is that games are about contextual decisions right they are uh, fundamentally linked to the environment in, or story or world in which they are made right the game system is the most natural thing that most people think of which are the rules the structures the mechanics it is the levers and buttons in which the players engage with the game with the scenario with each other and how feedback loops are mentioned in terms of decisions and consequences it is fundamentally how they take actions right and this and, and the game system fundamentally bounds their decision space of what they can and cannot do right the adjudication method or the engine um, of adjudication is often considered a part of the game system. Uh, many people often pair them together. Uh, for this portion, I have separated them because in professional uh, gaming, they're not always um, singularly uh, connected as a single element, right? So adjudication methods, because they can be used as different ways, um, the best way to think about them is how are players' actions judged, right? How are they judged in terms of success? How are they judged in terms of their interaction with each other? This can mean simple dice rolling like you do in commercial gaming, or it can involve uh, some integration with some kind of models and sim or some kind of calculator or some other analytical method. It can also mean often referring to a white cell, right? A group of subject matter expertise in which the actions are fed into and then the white cell produces some kind of judgment, right? There's a wide range of adjudication methods that are even wider in professional gaming than commercial gaming uh, because they can be they can span the spectrum of rigid like you know bounded in the rules in the box sort of methods to more open ended where you have expertise and you have a white cell and you involve other people in the process of judging uh, players actions. Another core element that uh, that often gets overlooked is that every game has to have some kind of victory condition. Why is this important is because players decisions are incentivized and they have to be um, bounded within the motivation which you provide their players, which is often through a goal, right? These victory conditions can be very reflective like commercial games where you must seize a specific territory, a specific hex, uh, con uh, conduct this, this number of attrition on the enemy force, win the game, whatever that means, right? 
but it can also have broader elements. It can be tied to a key metric in the game, whether that's influence or popularity or regime stability and so forth. The idea is that the victory conditions are really important because they undercut and contextualize a lot of the player's decisions as much as the scenario does in the very beginning, uh, as this serves as the stepping off point for the players. The last portion, which is sort of optional at times, is the analytical framework. Uh, the reason I say it's optional is that not all games are analytical, nor are they all designed to collect data from their players, right? But if you are doing an analytical game, you will have some kind of analytical framework that is integrated from beginning to end of the design process of your game, right? It is fundamentally looks at how to collect, assess, um, and sort of um, allow data to be collected from your players, either about their decision making, uh, about the context of their decision making or their logic. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this is often called the DCAP, the data collection and analytical plan, right? So we talked about games, what make, uh, what parts make up a game. And now we're gonna talk about how games are used in the professional military setting, right? Uh, there are many ways to uh, categorize war games. I've done it by purpose because I find this the most um, elucidating way to do it because format can be blurry. People have arguments about definitions um, and purpose applies how you can use it in your day-to-day -day analysis or your day-to-day -day use as an educational tool, right? So this these are defined by their objective. What kind of outcome or objective are they feeding as a game, right? So there are this, these five categories are pulled from a RAN report that Yuna Wong and I did when we were at RAN looking at uh, the future of wargaming for the Marine Corps. So we define them in five categories as concept development, capability development, senior leadership, uh, support to O plans or war plans, and training and education, right? So concept development is really looking at a concept, right? Some kind of novel idea or way to do military operations. These can also involve technology, and often a subclass of these games are called SNT games or science and technology games. So for example, if your game is like, hey, we want to look at expeditionary advanced basing operations in the early days of the Marine Corps when they was looking at um, Force Design 2030 before it was even called that, right? These were concept development games. You see sort of a slide of EABO concepts on the right-hand side. A capability development uh, game is really designed at defense and resource allocation uh, decisions, right? This is looking at force design, looking at how something should be made of. Uh, often they can also be called organizational games or, um, or strategic games are often like sort of paired as these capabilities development games, right? But one of the ideas is like, hey, if you have uh, a notion of like, should we invest in prisms or drones or something like that as a service, as not so much an operational tactical sense, right? Of how do we develop these things sort of acquisition wise and budget wise, these are capability development games. Senior leadership games are often designed as socializations or strategic discussions. They tend, be, tend to be really short comparative to capability and concept development games. Those games tend to be about five to 10 days long, right? A full days of, of gaming. They usually average about five days, right? Senior leadership games, right? They tend to be about like two to three hours, right? Even sometimes less than that, right? I've run senior leadership games where they were like, you got 45 minutes, right? Um, so these tend to be really short, uh, really focused and narrow. Um, they don't tend to focus too much on the details as much as the socialization of idea or concept or as a way for senior leaders to engage with their counterparts, whether whether they are fellow service members in the United States military or with other members of other um, countries and military establishments. Support to O-Plans is one of my favorite types of games. These are really designed to assess and support the, the writing of campaign plans at the combatant commands, right? Uh, also known as O-Plans, right? These are designed as part of the cycle that uh, combatant commands usually go through every few years to re uh, revise and update their O-Plans or even sometimes uh, devise whole new ones, right? These are done at the operational and sort of tactical level, depending on what problem they're looking at. Sometimes you can war game the entire O-Plan, right? Which can be weeks and series of games. Sometimes you're just doing a portion of it. If you're adding a, a specific element, whether you're doing, let's say a littoral raid or you're doing uh, a new concept of BMD defense. Training education game are sort of this large bucket of uh, other games, as you could probably say, uh, the other four categories sort of fit within analytical games. They are really looking at 
uh, collecting data, looking at data of player decisions and feeding it into a wider form of analysis. What uh, Peter Perler calls a cycle of research, which we'll talk about a bit later. But training education game is the other large bucket in which is about knowledge transfer. And we'll talk a bit more about this, but mainly it looks at how players can learn from the game, either from each other, from the game system or from the interaction of. So some brief examples, if you have never really engaged with wargaming uh, professionally, historically, or you know, sort of uh, recreationally, uh, I want to give three sort of quick examples. Um, there are lots of great articles and videos about all three of these case studies. Um, and I sort of endeavor everyone to sort of dive into the one that you sort of want to. Uh, but the first one we'll talk about is the West, uh, Western Approaches Tactical Unit, also known as WATU. They were, uh, a group within the British Navy during the Second World War that applied educational and analytical wargaming to combat the German U-boat threat or submarine threat during the Battle of the Atlantic. It is the first black and white photo in the center where you see women uh, who are uh, British officers, uh, naval officers called Wrens, um, sort of serving as computers, facilitators, and analysts during the game. And you see the chalk marks on the floor, which are the game map that um, detailed positions of submarines, but also position of civilian convoys, but also mo most importantly, the position of British uh, destroyers that were serving as their escorts. On the, on the right-hand side of that white screen, you see British officers looking through this sort of peephole through a blanket. The reason this mechanic was used is to limit the knowledge in which uh, players had of their, not only of their other teams, but also of submarine positions, right? So you can only really look at where your ship was, and sometimes you will lose sight or, or situational awareness of the convoy, of your fellow escorts, and so forth, right? And you'll, uh, you, know, you can sort of imagine the chaos of them trying to figure out what everything is doing and how they're reacting to it. The most important part, uh, part of Watu is that they use both educational and analytical gaming in tandem to each other. They use analytical gaming to sort of explore and deduce how U-boat uh, U-boat captains and sort of convoys were essentially attacking uh, civilian convoys as they were heading to the UK during the war. Uh, tr transporting supplies that are much needed in terms of food and munitions and so forth. Uh, they, deduced, they deduced that U-boats uh, were actually attacking uh, the convoys from within, uh, actually contrary to their initial belief that submarines were attacking torpedoes from the outside in. So, and th this actually led to a change in tactics right, in real time as they uh, used a technique called Raspberry, which when destroyers will actually turn around and actually go in the wake of the convoy and try to drop depth charges, which actually increased uh, the kill rate of submarines. Um, at the same time, they use educational gaming uh, to inform new captains going out into the Battle of the Atlantic, Atlantic as part of their escort duty and also incorporated uh, officers who are coming off the line to allow sort of an exchange of institutional knowledge, right? So they can learn from each other, learn from each other's experience. But also the game uh, served as a way to constantly incorporate new intelligence, new tactics that were being fed and adapt those and teach those to the next group that was going out. Um, there's a fantastic story about how the Rens and these women really uh, worked on this. I highly, um, there's a book whose name, which is uh, escaping me at the moment, but I highly recommend you looking into it. And the next, around the same time, is the U.S. Naval War College Interwar Period Games. These were, uh, these are the famous games, right, that we often refer to, the, the games that won the war, right? And often the, that moniker is, is, both correct and wrong in its own way. They were a series of games that ran from the late 1910s all the way up to uh, oh, the breakout of the war at the Naval War College. These games are predominantly classified as three games called Duel, Fleet Tactical, and Strategic. Eventually, Duel went away uh, in later years, uh, in around nine, in, in the early 1900s, right? As they focused more on Fleet Tactical, which focused on two fleets fighting each other, and Strategic, which uh, focused on multiple fleets fighting across a wider theater of conflict, right? Why is this important? Is because as you sort of see uh, an older uh, folder uh, uh, photo from the 1950s after the war in Pringle Hall in the, 19, uh, in the Naval War College with its famous black and white checkerboard, and you sort of see the stands up in the back there. The games were played on the on the floor as a way to set distance and so forth, but uh, reminiscent of how Watu did it, uh, they drew inspiration from um, Crickspiel, which was a Prussian um, um, war game. Right, where they looked at land combat, 
but more importantly, these games were important because they went through several iterations and they educated a whole generation of naval officers, right? Um, one thing I will say about this is that although Nimitz uh, after the war uh, gives a lot of credit to these games and these games were incredibly powerful as an educational PME uh, venue and tool, right? And methodology, right? It should not be confused in the sense that these games were productive. Many of these games got a lot of things wrong, right? They underestimated the value of uh, carrier aircraft, right? They underestimated the, uh, the power of submarines, right? They have their own biases of their own designers of what they thought the battleship was still the king of naval battle, right? But at the same time, they also highlighted a lot of great things through tactical contextual decision making. One is that they highlight elements of the uh, early elements and contours of the island hopping campaign, the importance of four positions and, uh, and fueling stations, right? The importance of reconnaissance you know, at distance and so forth, right? Another big portion is that it gave these young officers when the Navy was quite small, right? Uh, when the Navy was actually restricted by uh, conventions of how many ships they can produce, how big they could be and so forth. This was a great way for young naval officers at different echelons to practice command, right? To practice how to coordinate fleets, how to work with uncertainty, how to manage risk and work as a team, right? So many of the uh, admirals that would eventually become uh, famous captains and commanders of the war, like Spruance, Nimitz, uh, and so forth on Halsey, they all went through this program e uh, either as students, um, or as faculty later, and they fed this cycle of a wider sort of exploration of naval combat at the time during the interwar period. There's a great book by Lillard, Lillard called Playing War, right, which I recommend. Another, There's another book whose name is Escaping Me, which is done by the U.S. Naval War College Press as well. TAC War was actually after the war, right? This was a series of educational games uh, or a family of games, often uh, collectively called TAC War, but they were comprised of four different games, TAC War, Steel Thrust, Landing Force, and Warfare. Um, I will say that these were also educational in nature, but they were based on an analytical game called the Landing Force game during the 1960s. These uh, these educational games found real value in the uh, late 70s to the early 90s, right up to the uh, first Gulf War. The most important thing about these games is that each of those four games were seated within an echelon and an audience in which they were designed for. TAC Wars was designed for battalion and company levels. So they really focused on tactical warfare. How do I move this tank? How do I engage this with my company and so forth? Steel Thrust looked at what we call the Mew today, right? Um, and then landing force looked at what we call today the MEB, right, or brigade level, and warfare focused on what we call the MEF today, right, or sort of, um, you know, I mean, core level. What What is important about these games is that they were all sort of seated within a family of games, and they use an infrastructure in which the Marine Corps established to make these games available to tactical units, right? This was not just stuck at one institution like the Naval War College games, or let's say WATU, Pac War was really a democratization of educational gaming down to the tactical units, right? Where um, both the Amphibious Warfare School, or what, what we call today uh, Expeditionary Warfare School, or EWS used it. Uh, different schools in the NCO Academy also used it. And they also were used at all the major bases at Lejeune, Pendleton, and Okinawa at the time. You'll see great articles from the 90s and 80s of Marine Corps officers uh, talking about TAC war, right? Um, and discussing how they're using it, how it can be improved, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, TAC war so, uh, eventually went out of favor as it became sort of heavy and became increasingly difficult to run. And also the infrastructure that was designed to support it in the sense of like there were places on bases which you, you can go to, to learn how to facilitate, learn how to play the game, but also get like pieces that were replaced or lost and so forth and get new maps. Eventually that structure went away and so did the game, right? Unfortunately. So why are games important? Uh, I love using this uh, line from Dedrick Dorner from his uh, Logic of Failure, which is geniuses are geniuses by birth, where, are, where else the wise gain their wisdom through experience. And it seems to me that the ability to deal with problems in the most appropriate way is the hallmark of wisdom rather than genius. So if that is the case, right? Games, right? Whether they be analytical or educational, they're all fundamentally experiential. And that is one of the key ways we as people really make uh, decisions and how we often make decisions about the future, about uncertainty. We are creatures of our own experiences. We are culminations of those, right? There is that adage that often uh, is served as sort of a uh, insult 
to the military thinking class where they uh, we always accuse them of fighting the last war, right? This is not because they're dumb or stupid or they don't read. It is because they are prisoners of our, of their last experience. If you're if you grew up uh, fighting as a young lieutenant or a, as a captain in the first Gulf War, right? That is a powerful experience. It is a formative experience that is experiential and powerful, emotionally charged, and it is the thing that your brain goes to first, right? When you think about warfare, right? So even though you may know about UAS or you know I mean cyber uh, uh cyber capabilities if your first experience and your one of your most powerful experiences as a young officer is the first Gulf War that is often your one and only experiential memory that your brain will go to to pull lessons from games whether they be analytical or educational are ways to add synthetic experiences to a player's mind so they can have other experiences that are emotionally charged that are able to have your brain have bookmarked on portions of your experiences and for you to refer to. Uh, it is one of the powerful ways of how games work. So how do analytical games work? Uh, I will only touch on this sort of uh, broadly, uh, broadly on this next on this slide and the next, and we can talk more about it. But analytical games really sit within a wider cycle of research. And you see the graphic from Peter Perlis, uh, famous art of wargaming, which has wargaming up in the top left-hand corner, exercises in the top right-hand corner, and analysis or other forms of analysis at the very bottom. And he has these legs that show what their focus is on, right? Which is war games really focus on decisions and consequences. Exercises really focus on actions are also what I call skills. And then al analysis really focuses on data, right? Or assessments. And then one thing to learn from this is that you need all the legs of the, of the cycle to really get at the problem, right? Uh, models and sims, case studies, and other forms of analysis will only give you one slice of the pie, as war games will also give you only one slice of the pie. Similarly, exercises like Grim Pack and Cobra Gold and Resolute Dragon, Keen Edge, and so forth, will also only give you one slice. And only by feeding into each other uh, and getting feedbacks from each other uh, can you really get a whole picture of the problem? And that's sort of what doing analysis uh, by Polsky and Logal, which is an Naval War College uh, article about uh, doing analysis of games, sort of represent in their little Venn diagram is that when these are all sort of overlapped, right? you get a better uh, picture of the war fighting problem, right? And it also increases the rigor and impact of each of these methods. Each of these methods, as all of you know, right? No method is perfect, right? Each of them have their own biases, their own flaws, their own shortcomings, right? For example, war games have really low end values, right? In which that they don't, they're not really, uh, um, high iterative, right? Let's say MS and in other sense, right? Are highly iterative, but also to have uh, a really good MS model, you make your own assumptions, just like a war game model, right? There are baselines, assumptions, and things that you have to make because it is a complicated world, right? Similarly, exercises when you do them in real life will often only provide you slow, uh, low end values as well, but also there are uh, organizational limitations in which you still need to train, you still need to certify if you're doing a carrier strike group, uh, you know what I mean, certification process, right? So you're not gonna do a uh, wide ranging uh, sort of uh, outlier uh, training, right? You're gonna focus on what the average is. So you, you tend to have a bias towards the middle, right? In your data outcomes. But the important part is all these uh, three elements are supposed to be corresponding with each other, complementing each other in the wider process, right? Uh, unfortunately, rarely does one organization own an entire problem from beginning to end in this cycle. Often, like let's say at CNA or other organizations like Livermore, you will do one portion of it, hand it off to another office, like whether it's a service analytical session uh, uh, center like. Uh, the Center for Army Analysis or OAD in the Marine Corps and so forth to do another form and it sort of goes around the circle. And you never really quite know where your, your data is going and coming, um, but it is one of the challenges of uh, doing analysis in our field. So to sort of focus on uh, doing analysis, um, I'm just gonna briefly go over this, which is there are a couple of ways to do analysis, but mostly it focuses on either on outputs, like what is the output of the game? Did you win? Did you lose? Um, you can do this by metrics, right? How much was your influence? How much was your cyber resiliency in the game? Whatever uh, output that you have, right? Another way to analyze games is by the decisions of the players and their sort of motive and logic, right? This is more uh, qualitative, right? Um, 
but you can also try to do some quantitative analysis of at what point in the conflict and so forth does do these decisions sort of cluster, right? You can also do the third method, which is trying to establish trends or insights in a wider cycle of research or analysis, right? One thing I will say is that games fundamentally, like any other analytical tool or educational tool, are bounded by their objectives, whether they are training and learning objectives or bounded by their analytical questions, right? There are always caveats that apply, right? There's a reason often why a game has been scoped the way it is, right? For example, if you have an operational game that just starts and the war has started, authorities have been given, right? Right. Why is that case is what you should be asking as a as a fellow analyst reading about that game. And as a good designer, as a good analyst designing that game, you should also provide the reason why these caveats were applied. Right. You may say, hey, we don't really care about escalation dynamics. We don't care about the wider conflict. We just really want to look at this conflict and how this technology applies. And you're like, OK, I understand why. Right. But then these assumptions may have other third, for, uh, first, second and third order effects uh, that are important to sort of lay out. Gameplay and results are always observations, right? They are not facts. Uh, this is always one of the problems when you read about games of saying like, hey, games have predicted this and they have uh, they uh, they have shown this or demonstrated or validated this. Uh, games do not validate anything, right? It is like saying, hey, this one thing we have done for five days have validated something, right? That does, That's not how validation works, right? But often it is a term that is thrown around uh, either out of ignorance or out of uh, willful malign uh, uh, motives, right? Of trying to give it more credibility than it really deserves, right? Um, next slide I'm going to focus on is how I think about design. Uh, this is my one uh, tearaway slide about how to think about design, which is all game designers, one, will have their own style, their own approach. How I I'll talk about in conceptual design is fundamentally different from even my teammates at CNA. Uh, this is because we are experimental creatures, right? Uh, I come from a humanities background. I come from a military background when I was a, a sergeant in the Marine Corps. So I think of conflict very differently uh, than, let's say, my colleague, Jeremy Sapinski, who is the lead war game designer at CNA. Uh, and he comes from a PhD in astrophysics background, come from a STEM background. Uh, and he thinks of games often from top down. And I think of it often from a bottom up approach and not to say these are better or worse they're just how we think about it how we're comfortable of about developing schemas but in the next couple of things i will describe is how we all sort of think of games sort of broadly uh one of the things is that we often have to define the story of our game the narrative right um it is like any other creative thing there has to be some overarching plot some overarching narrative that binds the story together right because uh as ed mcgrady and peter perlow often write is that games are, are interactive stories right it is your own choose your own, own adventure in a more complex form right how i think about developing my story is actually from a conversation i had with uh other marines when they were talking about log lines right which is a method in film and writing and creative arts of how to sort of summarize your plot and your story in a singular sentence without giving away the ending right uh, you often see log lines on netflix or hulu as you sort of see that one sentence of like it is not a uh so much a a a full description of what the uh, what the a movie or title or a book is about, but sort of it, it gives you the broad strokes of the contour of the plot of the narrative, right? There is some kind of inciting event, right? Uh, that happens, right? There is some kind of protagonist that decides to do something against some kind of antagonist, right? So if you think of Lord of the Rings, right? The inciting event is that, you know what I mean? The, the forces of evil are sort of on the move, on the hunt for the ring, the protagonist, right? Um, Frodo and Sam discover the ring and they have decided to create a fellowship, right? Do some action to destroy the ring at Mount Doom against the forces of evil and Saruman, right? That is sort of the, the, the energizing element of the story. You don't give away elements of how the story has happened, but it is the thing, the story, the, uh, the narrative that will bound your, your media. The next thing I think about of thinking about the game system, right, of, and also thinking about building the schema, the underlying model, right? Uh, I use schema instead of model because it often confuses people when I think of, when I say war games and models. But I, when I refer to schema, I think of a mental model, right? Uh, whether that's a process chart, whether that's an agent-based model, whether that is literally scribbles on a whiteboard, right, is how I think and break down uh, a complex phenomenon into uh, 
more digestible, simplified bits, right? How I think about it is influenced by uh, another commercial designer called Rolf Costner, who was one of the forerunners of commercial games, both in the digital and um, you know, sort of manual commercial gaming field, right? And he describes them as nouns, units of action, verbs, the major actions that are often linked to nouns, right? They can be um, specifically bounded to a noun, right? Or objects, or which are often resources or commodities within your system. So as an example in the Toral Commander, the units are units of actions. The nouns are these units, the counters, right? They are logistic companies, Marine Corps formations, uh, naval ships, right? Their verbs are only four things, really three things, because uh, that are bounded to these uh, nouns, which is to do combat, right? To move in combat, move and conceal, and then move and resupply, right? The other four after fourth action in the game which is resupply is not done by these nouns they're done by the player so that they're not bounded to these counters right all right um these verbs right combat concealment resupply are bounded by objects or commodities in the game which are supply right which is i only have so much long range strike which is represented by red squares in this game so if you look at ddg 90 right that 14 means i need that's a my pk right so i need a 14 and below to hit on my offensive fires right so if every time i roll a dice i will have to look for 14 and below to represent a, a, a good hit and the exponent is or superscript is the range in our game they're infinite because they're bigger than um, the map but more importantly they they have a finite number so dg ddg 90 only has 10 long range strike dice those red dice right so that is a commodity every time i do my noun does a verb which is combat or long range strike it consumes an object or commodity to do that right when i have run out of my commodities they can no longer do that verb right that is a very simple way to explain that right um another portion is that game mechanics are simplifications of real world processes and dynamics right there is some level of abstraction and what level of abstraction is required for your game depends on your purpose your objective and what you're trying to get out of it right so for example in my game a dice roll represents many things it represents the pk of finding it on radar the pk of finding a firing solution the pk of like the missile itself right and the pk uh uh dynamic between getting through air defense which we'll talk about a little bit later but it can represent lots of things right in a single action or mechanic right and that is an abstraction right um if your game requires all those things to be broken out then you need different mechanics or steps in your game to do that sometimes even my level of gaming abstraction is too much you need to even abstract it even more right uh for like a strategic game for senior leaders right they don't want they don't care about missile salvos right they care about wider strategic high operational decisions right the other portion is that there is an inherent tension always, as I've been hinting, between realism and fidelity or granularity versus playability and accessibility. As your game tries to be more reflective of real life, of all the tiny steps and interactions that the real world has, right? Um, I am developing a game with a colleague of mine um, looking at sound propagation in submarines as a little micro game like, that will fit on a PowerPoint slide. And we have to abstract things. There is so much complication in the in the calculation of sound propagation in water and in terms of submarines and right that we have to abstract it right for it to be playable to be accessible in the medium in which we have chosen which is to play within like 30 to 40 minutes right in a single play right so that is for that game i am putting we are putting more emphasis on the accessibility and playability versus the realism right uh because it's designed as a sort of intro int introduction to submarine warfare to someone who is not who knows nothing about submarine warfare or sound propagation right um at the same time we always have to do lots of play testing it is essential constant and it is iterative it will go back to the cycle of like hey we did this uh play testing our schema sort of broken we've forgotten elements of it and we need to adjust it right it is time consuming you never have enough play testing. You never had enough time. So bake in lots of time to do that. One other thing I will mention about uh, play testing is uh, play testing should involve both internal play testing to your organization, but also external, because you will also have biases of you've been looking at this game for a long time, and sometimes you will fill in holes. We call this the designer bias, right? Um, that you will fill in holes, literally words like you've like uh, you miss or you interpret the words in a very specific way that you, because you wrote them, you understand your own intention, and that's not always the case. I know I am running a little late, so I will uh, sort of try to focus a little bit better. So Littoral Commander is a educational game. 
uh, plays about two to six. It is high tactical. You see a couple of Marines playing it at the College of Enlisted Military Education as part of their career school, right, which is designed for staff sergeants, right? It is their capstone game. Uh, the main thing you have to look at is that it looks at con a conflict at 2030 and beyond. It was really designed to look at EABO and the stand-in force and force design 2030 for the Marine Corps, but it has a, a, a broader joint perspective. It doesn't say, hey, the Marine Corps is going to win the war against China by itself in a hypothetical conflict. It's, it's really asking a question, how does the Marine Corps contribute to the wider joint fight in this small tactical level? The players are really representing battalions or battery or company level leadership, right, of saying, hey, I am a captain or a major, and I'm, I've been designated to defend this straight, and how do I kill run highs, right? How do I you know, exert sea control and sea denial? How do I get onto this island? How do I resupply this position? These are sort of the tactical decisions they have to make. Um, the main focus of the game is really to actively plan and coordinate in teams. You play in teams where each player represents different task forces. You have to think across contested and multi-domain uh, operations, right? You have to think about cyber, you have to think about uh, fires, underwater drones, uh, aircraft, all those things, right? You have to consider commodities, which is are really the logistics constraints and really only looks at um, munitions, mainly because given the time scale, which is about two or three hours per turn, you play less than a day and you won't starve or nor run out of fuel within a day typically, right? So, uh, we have only really focused on munitions, which tend to have high burn rates and they're quite difficult to resupply, right, in contested environments. And also leverage capabilities across the joint force, which are represented by cards, right? So in terms of the foundational schema, what is like the mental model that undercuts the total commander? And it is the F2, T2, EA process. For those who are unfamiliar, there's a great graphic on the right-hand side, which is what often we call the kill chain, right? It is how do I find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess a target. And it's, it's this constant loop that goes back and forth. And there is this target engage portion and doesn't and typically refers to like kinetic fires, firing a missile, artillery barrage, or suicide um, drone, but can also mean kinetic fires, right? How do I, you, this can be applied to cyberspace, uh, to aircraft, as much as um, missile fires, right? But the big portion is that the game fundamentally breaks it down into these sort of portions. And the game further abstracts this to sort of uh, bins, right? So find, right, so is this broad like notion of like, I know where you generally are. Uh, in the Navy, we often refer to like taxit two, right? Like, I know you are in this broad area, but I need to truly fix uh, you and track you uh, to finally target you, which is like drop a warhead on a forehead sort of notion of uh, understanding, which is in the game, the game counters represent, hey, I know they exist somewhere in this 20 kilometer across hex, right? You have found them, right? But I need to find really fix track and target them, which is I need to reveal them, which is you need to flip the counter using some kind of ISR that can be cyber means, EMS means, a SIGINT, uh, direct observation. It can be satellites. It can be drones. It can be a plethora of cards, or methods uh, that you can tr truly get them to tax at one, right? And you can only engage really tax at one or reveal targets in the game. It doesn't allow you to break that rule, right? Because if we're trying to teach them this process of modern conflict, uh, right, of this F2, T2, EA process, right? But units also can conceal. They fundamentally are able to go uh, backwards, right? They, you say, hey, you have targeted me, but now it is my turn, so I can try to conceal myself and get myself back to Texas too, right? Uh, and so forth. And there's also an element of decoys, right? There are dummy counters on the board where uh, they either absorb uh, hits for people, but also confuse that not every stack, not every counter is a legitimate target. Some of them will be dummies, right? You will find, you will try to do, a, uh, let's say, a predator drone trying to reveal a counter in a hex, and you reveal it, and it's a dummy counter, right? You have used your very precious ISR to find a dummy, right? Uh, and so forth. So. Part of the game engine in Littoral Commander is really based on Wayne Hughes' seminal book called Fleet Tactics, which looks at salvo equations. And um, I really distilled his salvo equation down to be the combat engine of the game, especially for long range strike, as we were thinking about it. For those who are unfamiliar, I have a little clip of it uh, from his book. Is Also, there is a great, another more recent book uh, by the Naval uh, Institute called uh, Fighting the Fleet, right? 
uh, which also builds on uh, Wayne Hughes's work, right? It's really accessible. I highly, it's really short. You can finish it in a day. Um, but most importantly, his uh, Wayne Hughes really thinks about uh, about salvo equations in the way of the number of hits A that a ship will take will really be determined by the offensive power of the attacker B, right? Deducted by the defensive power of A, right? Applied to what he calls the endurance power of A, right? How many hits it can take, right? This often is uh, equated to armor and so forth, right? Uh, in the same way, the game uh, for littoral commander takes the same approach, right? Literally, the way the game mechanic works is that each dice for offensive fires has a PK, as you have seen with DDG90 earlier. You roll that many dice. So if I roll 10 dice, I hit on 14s and below. I have seven successes. Then my defender, let's say, which is my target, uh, is a run high. He will roll, let's say, 10 dice in defense. His PK, let's say, is 14 as well. He rolls six. Uh, uh, he, he only gets six hits, right? Those six hits will negate six of my successes, right? So of my nine hits, right, uh, only three will get through his IADs, and they will apply to, uh, hits on his endurance power and what we call hit points in the game, how many hits his ship can take. And that will, and that number is two in the game, so his ship will be sunk, right? Because my, uh, my the, uh, remaining offensive power uh, exceeds his endurance power, right, his hit points, right? So representing in his destruction, right? Um, that is the fundamental how salvo uh, equations really run the long range strike engine of the game. Uh, ground combat was really more inspired by Trevor DePuy and his work, right? Um, and it is a simplified way of looking at combat equations. There are many abstractions, right? It assumes that um, units are like automatons, right? They don't die, they don't get tired, they don't get fatigued, they don't get scared, they don't break. There's no sense of will, right? But his way was. Uh, uh, Dupuy's method was easy to calculate combat scores for really complex units, right, across echelons, uh, and it worked for us because we we're looking at the platoon and lower level, was really looking at aggregated weapon types in a unit, and essentially uh, looking at how many casualties they can inflict in a uh, in a set amount of time, which was about two to three hours, right? Uh, and we applied this sort of systemic process across all the units. We use Excel sheets, but more than anything, we also both for the PKs of the weapons for long range strike, but also the PK systems for the aggregated units for ground combat. We asked subject matter expertise of like, does this look right, right? Um, and they we would say, hey, these are the weapons. We think this is organic. Blah blah blah. Uh, these are the abstractions, these are the numbers we gave, and this is how we did our math. And we got a lot of great feedback, not only through playtesting, but also through uh, people who knew these uh, uh, units and how they would tactically employ them, right? Uh, and that's one thing that, you know, Dupuy's method doesn't really uh, do, which is the use of tactics, right? Of how they would make things more lethal, even though a weapon system itself may not be lethal in a vacuum, right? Uh, last thing I want to talk about is how we did terrain analysis in the game. Uh, as you saw in the earliest pictures, uh, the game is color coded. Uh, for those who are colorblind, um, there is also text in each box that represents its terrain value or how hard it is to go inside of it, right? The way we did this is that we had a great geographer named Matt Kramer uh, who was able to do some terrain analysis for us on ArcGIS. But essentially, the process is best represented by this graphic on the right hand side, which is we got multiple layers of data through ArcGIS. GIS and essentially looked at elevation, uh, land cover, uh, infrastructure like roads and balometry, which is like the mean and min depth of water. And we apply them all together and essentially said, hey, we want to give a score for the hex area, which it is looking at. So 20 kilometers across, about 260 square kilometers uh, uh, area and say, hey, how difficult is, is it for one uh, 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 combatant, uh, tier one combatant ship? warship to uh, move across in the water? And two, how hard is it for a JLTV slash wheel vehicle to traverse this territory, right? And we gave a different uh, scores and modifiers, right? So for example, if you're saying, hey, there's a bunch of roads like highways, then your score goes up, right? Uh, minor roads will say you only get a smaller modifier and so forth. If you had hot, huge elevation in, in that area, you got bad modifiers saying that it increases difficulty and so forth. Again, this is not a perfect method, but it was a way for us to use open source data uh, to apply systemic um, uh, process across all of our maps, right? And also show our homework, right? 
um, of how we got these numbers, right? It wasn't just like, hey, we think this is four, right? It was like, hey, we went through these numbers and if it fell in this category, it went uh, and went to one and went into two and went to three and so forth, right? This is important because the game really wanted to incorporate terrain in a simple, accessible way while still having a really rigorous method behind it, right? Another thing about this is that these maps, right, are not perfect because open source data has holes, there are flaws, right, there are things missing. For example, we're currently doing the ones for the Baltics, and as we're doing them, we often go through cycles of iterations, right? So we'll produce a map, we'll tweak our method, and then we'll send it on the maps out to a bunch of subject matter experts that either operate, live, or have deployed in the area. So we work with other institutions in the Baltics and say, hey, look at this area, do we have anything missing? Like, for example, one of our uh, peer reviewers for our maps said, hey, um, some of these borders, right, like uh, between Belarus, right, actually have a bunch of like Constantine wires, right? They have set up a bunch of man-made obstacles to actually make movement across this area incredibly difficult, right, uh, in the last year or two. Um, that was not in our data set, so it, it was pretty easy to go, go across the border. And then we had a discussion, do we make these man-made things uh, a part of our uh inherent map right and we decided against them we put it on a footnote in the scenario booklet but also in the map section of our upcoming rule book of saying hey you can add these things and this is how we recommend you uh, uh increase or decrease uh the movement value and mobility of each of these hexes along the belarus border right there are other things where they're like hey they actually have new roads here they actually increase a mode uh, mobility or you're missing this airfield that is expeditionary up in wherever right so there's a great way of getting feedback because not all um, data sets are imperfect right uh, last thing I will uh, talk about, or second to last thing, is the OWS system. Um, I did not want to just talk about my game. So Tim Barrick, uh, uh, former director of the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab uh, Wargaming Division and retired colonel now, he is now the Educational Wargame Director at Marine Corps University. He designed OWS while he was in uniform and has created many expansions about it. Since then, it looks at... Um, the operational level of war, right? My game looks at the tactical level of war. So I love using this photo because you saw Luzon in a previous uh, slide and you see that one hex of his game is like my entire map, right? Um, we fundamentally look at different scales and different decision spaces. He looks at like the JTF level, the joint task force level. If you are the GIF MIC, the GIF LIC or the JFAC, right? This is the game for you, right? If you're looking at how do I, as a staff, fight across a theater, right? Very similar to the Naval War College's sort of uh, strategic game, right? This is sort of very similar, right? High operational, looking at um, uh, that level of decision making, right? Surface action groups accrossing the entire theater, uh, doing joint fires, right? While my game is really looking at a really tactical joint fires fight, uh, fight, right? Is how do I coordinate and engage at, at the small tactical levels, right? Because the abstractions are different. Mine are 20 kilometer hexes. His are like, I think 200 nautical mile hexes, right? Across, right? So you're just thinking in abstractions at very different levels, but fundamentally they're actively planning, they're coordinating and doing operational art. And they're really thinking about multi-domain uh, multi capabilities. So even though our game, looks at the same thing, which is that 20, 30 time frame and beyond, multi-domain, joint fires and joint uh, fighting, right? Uh, he looks at it from a different level, from a different perspective, and so do I. Uh, both games are great, in my opinion. They work great in tandem together, right? And the reason I say this is that uh, just like the Tack War family of games, these games sit, sit, sit in each other sort of uh, inadvertently by coincidence. We didn't design them to be working like that but they work great together. Some games are great for the littoral commander system that looks at specific technologies at a really small scale, right? While OWS sometimes is better for a wider joint audience when you're looking at theater fights, right? Uh, I will have one last slide, which is there is no substitute for designing one's first game, right? From inception to execution, there is literally no no substitute for it. You can read all the theory, you can read all the books, uh, listen to all the lectures, no matter how good they are. Uh, there is no nothing like just designing your first game uh, beginning to end, no matter how ugly it is, right? Similarly, playing games will give you that notion of how, what the excitement, that thrill of defeating a thinking av uh, adversary, but also how to engage with decision space. Um, I mentioned to Mike before that my students uh, design games in my class at Georgetown. 
where I serve as an adjunct. And these are three examples. Uh, the left hand one is initial success or total failure designed for the Marine Corps EOD school, right? Looking at tactical EOD decisions. Uh, Major's Gambit looks at brigade combat, which was designed for US Command and General Staff College, right? Which is part of, used as part of their curriculum. Uh, this is a recent photo, I think the last year as, as they were using it. Uh, and the last photo it was designed for Air University, looking at influence in the Indo-Pacific across time, right? And uh, this is uh, currently also being used, right? So so there is a wide spectrum of games, how you can think about them from tactical EOD games to really wide strategic games at looking at dime. Um, and I will also, I think, share these slides with our uh, guests, uh, with our hosts. And at the end of them, they have these organizational links. If you're interested about more about wargaming from CNA to uh, Australian Defense College and the Joint Warfare Center, which is the center for wargaming for NATO and all the different connections conferences that happen across the world. And also some resources in terms of books, web links, uh, handbooks, and so forth, like re two recent editions, like the NATO Handbook, uh, which was published by uh, ACT, Allied Transformation Command, uh, or Command of Transformation, and then DSTL's Influence Wargaming Handbook that also came out earlier this year in the spring that looks at how do you look at wargaming influence. And one of my games, Malign, uh, with Emily Yoler, is also featured as one of the case studies. Uh, and if you're interested in getting in contact with me, this is my personal email, my work email if you're doing work stuff for the Navy, uh, and also my Twitter if you're interested, right? And I think we are going to take questions now.